Thank you. Thank you very much, Annette, uh, first of all, for uh, organizing this event. It takes a lot of time and effort uh, to put together any kind of uh, event. And for ICAS for hosting me. It's such a pleasure to be here amongst uh, all of you. Uh, I remember very early on as a, as a researcher uh, for my PhD, uh, when we were researching about international branch campuses, one of the hot topic is, uh, topics, uh, always Temple University used to come up as a case study, as one of the earliest adopters of, of going abroad and building uh, cross-border partnerships uh, and campuses. So uh, I'm glad to be here uh, on campus. So um, as Anik mentioned, a lot of my work is related to international student mobility. And I'm going to talk about uh, some of the trends uh, related to it and what does it mean for universities. Uh, but also, I want, before I get started, one more thing I want to recognize. Um, and that is you. Uh, Friday evening, in the rain, you are in this room. That means a lot. So I really appreciate you taking out time uh, for, for, uh, for having this conversation. So definitely we'll make sure that there is some time towards the end to take your questions. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, of the type which uh, is fine for me if you think that uh, there is something to discuss or, or challenge or clarify right away we can take that. So we don't have to wait all the way to the end also. So if you think there is something needs to be uh, to discussed, uh, please feel free to ask uh, during the presentation. Just as a context, what uh, Annette mentioned, uh, my point of view uh, or the lens of looking at international student mobility uh, is as a scholar practitioner. And I'm using this word T-shaped professional, that is the dissertation topic of, uh, uh, of my dissertation, basically, uh, which is basically someone who can have an ability to talk interdisciplinarily across the fields, but have the depth of one domain or maybe two domains. So in my case, uh, I had a very unconventional career path in terms of education foundation that I studied actually undergraduate in uh, India uh, for my electronics and telecom engineering in India, a typical uh, career path for many engineers. So as they say, that if you throw a stone in India, uh, it is one in six times it will hit an engineer. And I've been hit by a stone a lot, of, lot many times. Uh, people were testing that hypothesis. And then uh, I did my MBA, because uh, that's what another thing, uh, characteristic of Indian higher education. You study for four years engineering, and then the next career path is to do an MBA. So you, you move uh, uh, to the different uh, stream, and that's what I did. I, I did my MBA from Mumbai. So a lot of my foundation in terms of looking at higher education is through this engineering and business perspective, uh, which gave me a real foundation for data, uh, uh, data-based strategies. But then um, after working for five years in India, uh, and including a, at a business school called Indian School of Business, ISB, in Hyderabad, uh, it's an ASCSB accredited business school. I got a chance to travel abroad, uh, going to a lot of education fairs, and uh, that really expanded my horizons. And it became clear that higher education is my calling. And uh, that's when I decided to come to the States to do my PhD in higher education uh, from University of Denver. And since then, I've worked in uh, New York City and uh, San Francisco area for almost uh, now 12 years. Um, and that's where my approach to international student mobility is all from the point of view of what does the mobility mean for university administrators and uh, leaders, but also national policy makers. That's the lens I usually take into my consideration. Skip this. So the headline number. Um, we, we, we hear this number uh, that student mobility is increasing. Um, there is 138% growth. Uh, in the mobile students from 2.2 million to 5.1 million. Now, that's a dramatic increase uh, in terms of international student mobility. But the key thing is, and my core argument is, that it is missing a lot of the nuances. First of all, it is missing out the complexity and unpredictability of student mobility in terms of who is going where and why. And that dynamics has been really changing. And I will illustrate it with some data and examples that there is a lot of uh, unpredictability in terms of mobility directions. The overall direction may be up in terms of number of students increasing. But where are they going and where are they coming from is really changing uh, uh, in these years. 
The second point I'm trying to make is uh, we really have to look at these country patterns uh, from the point of view also of uh, what national policies and institutional strategies are shaping them. So we'll talk about them a little bit. And the third uh, point I will discuss is the diversity within students. Uh, we often look at international students as one monolithic block, that all international students are the same. Uh, I'm arguing just the opposite, not all international students are the same. And that diversity within the students needs to be recognized. Uh, because it has implications for our goals, strategies, and the results. And finally, the sustainability. Um, there are ambitious targets that uh, have been put up uh, by institutions, by national agencies, in terms of growing international students. How realistic are they? Uh, can really, we can see the growth at the same pace what we have been seeing in the last 15 years, which is uh, at 138%, let's say. Uh, and for that, I will first talk about the diversity of students uh, and then move on to the changes in the last 15 years and what it will look like in the next uh, five to seven years. Um, the first part of the, of, uh, of the presentation is about the three waves. That's a, that's a core argument which I'm making. And the three waves are simply, I have picked up the markers. These are large, impactful events, external events, which really shaped who is going where. So for example, the wave one was initiated uh, pretty much after the uh, terrorist attack in the US, 9-11. Uh, uh, a, a tragedy which really changed the dynamics of uh, international student mobility. What happened immediately after that is in, in terms of the raising of the visa processes and the standards which were in the US, the CVIS system uh, was launched and many students started moving away from US to other destinations and Australia and the UK were actually the two biggest beneficiaries. And you will see it in terms of the numbers that how big that difference was. But the headline number here is that um, in this period, almost 50% growth just between 2001 and 2008. Um, 1.1 million new students were studying overseas in just seven years. But that growth was not in the US. It was going to the other destinations. Wave two. Global financial recession. Uh, now this started in the US. Ironically, actually US was the biggest beneficiary. US institutions were the biggest beneficiary in terms of attracting international students in this wave. And the reasons could be quite obvious. Uh, financial pressures, budget cuts, and many institutions found an opportunity and the need that they have to go out and recruit and attract international students. So 3.3 to 5.1, that had been the growth in this period of eight years between 2008 and 2016. And then the third wave I'm defining is the projection beginning with the 2016 as the impact of the new political order. Uh, unsurprising, the, the, the Brexit uh, was a trigger in, in 2016 uh, where the first uh, uh, indicators started emerging about the, uh, the impact of the new nationalism uh, which was emerging, and the second part uh, being the um, American presidential election in November 2016. Both of these major destinations, US and UK, uh, enroll about 30% of all international students overseas. And both these destinations got the biggest change in terms of the political systems, in terms of becoming less immigrant fr friendly, less welcoming to international students. And those students will get redirected to other destinations. But if you were to assume the growth rate of what we saw in wave two, which is about 50, 55%, then and extrapolated in wave three, then in this period, we should get 7.9 million expected enrollment by the end of 2024 an addition of 2.8 million new students. So the number one question I'm raising here in terms of sustainability, where would these students come from? 
which means if they are not coming from and if we can't get the numbers, then our expectations are wrong and our strategies which are going underneath those expectations and goals could be misaligned with the reality. So let's test this hypothesis. Can this goal be achieved? And what would it take uh, to, to reach there? Um, before we dig deeper, uh, I want to share this uh, argument about the diversity of international students, because that is very critical in terms of how we set the goals. And this is based on the research uh, uh, I took at uh, World Education Services in New York uh, several years ago. And it pretty much provided a segmentation framework to think about international students as a, on two primary dimensions, academic preparedness and financial resources. Now, this is a schema, a framework. Of course, not everybody will cleanly fit into these boxes, but it will provide us a framework to understand the diversity of needs of international students. So let's start with the first segment a segment of students who struggle in terms of uh, English preparedness and academic uh, uh, preparedness, plus the financial resources. They don't have as much of uh, uh, money to invest, but also they don't have the academic preparedness. Uh, many of them over the years have had an intention to emigrate out of their home country and find a pathway to a different country which can offer them a better way of life. And so immigration had been a big, big motivation for this segment of students. But right opposite to them are high flyers. Now, this is a group of students who have all the money they need to go to the best universities in any part of the world, but they also have the academic preparedness to achieve that, uh, uh, th that uh, requirements for admissions at the top universities. So many of them you can find in international schools. Uh, they already have come from, uh, from, from well-to-do countries, uh, uh, families, sorry. And uh, in, in the US especially, after the uh, global financial recession in the wave two, a significant growth happened in this segment also, uh, with many students coming from international schools heading towards uh, US and UK. But this is a traditional segment. This was the segment which was driving the growth in wave one, strivers. Now these are the segment which has low, uh, low uh, financial resources, but they are relatively high on academic preparedness. So the number one thing they are looking for is career advancement. They are looking for a way by which an international education can give them an edge to find career advancement. Many of them have been coming to graduate schools, masters or PhD level, not so much on the bachelor's level. High flyers, more likely to be at the bachelor's level. And then the fourth and final segment are the explorers. Now this is opposite of strivers in the sense that they have low academic preparedness, but they are high on financial resources. So they have all the money to invest, but not the preparation to, to get admitted to the top universities. Now, one change in wave two happened, a massive change in the US was the rise of intensive English programs. Massive growth in the US global, after global financial recession. A lot of Chinese students were enrolling in that. A uh, lot of Saudi Arabian students who were getting funding from the Saudi scholarships uh, government scholarships were finding their way uh, to those universities. And universities were very open to welcome because they were also under financial pressures. So this was a great pathway through intensive English programs. And then there were pathway programs. Now these are uh, commercial entities which were partnering with US universities to offer intensive English program plus academic credit, which can be transferred for the uh, uh, undergraduate program. Uh, so this started emerging to cater to the need of a lot of explorer students. They are very specific in terms of location. They have the money, so they, they are more specific in terms of being in larger cities uh, as compared to, let's say, strivers or strugglers who are cost conscious. So for them, they can be in any part 
of the world, but the cost is important parameters for them. For, so the, the, the key point here is that there are differences in terms of the needs behaviors and expectations of international students. Within, within the terminology we use of international students, there are huge differences. Uh, and it's important for us to understand them because they will define how realistic institutional strategies are in terms of targeting which segment. Maybe the one university wants to target high flyers. But then it really need, behooves the university to assess is really the university competitive enough to attract this segment of students in terms of ranking, in terms of location, in terms of experiences? All those things add up. But if you are getting most of the students in this segment, strivers, then you should be ready with a lot of scholarships. You should be ready with what are the post-career opportunities, career advising, because this is a very uh, career advancement focused segment. So these are a couple of examples to keep in mind. <coughs> And this is a slide to test your eyesight. <laughs> this is a complex slide, a uh, lot of numbers, so I'll very quickly try to break it down, uh, and we'll go deeper in uh, subsequently. Uh, but here the point is about the shift in destination countries. And I've broken it down by the three waves, so I've taken up 2001, 2008, and 2016. Um, the points which I mentioned, I'm just substantiating it with some numbers. Um, USA, as I mentioned, in the wave one, actually lost a lot of momentum. The growth was 31% as compared to UK and, US, uh, UK and Australia growing by 51 and 91%. But look at the following year. Actually, the other two countries did not gain as much growth as US. Now, this is only in the first box of English-speaking countries. One country which remained immune in both the waves is Canada. Any guess what could have contributed to its sustained momentum? American politics. Hmm, American politics, OK. But something Canada is doing intentionally to make sure that they can ride the wave. That's also one of the contributing factors. The biggest change and attractiveness for or biggest consistency in terms of its attractiveness had been its immigration policy. Always providing a pathway for students to gain work experience and potentially find a permanent residence in Canada because of its immigration friendly policies. And all the other all the top three countries have been very erratic in terms of their immigration policies and its connection with pathways for international students. And hence, you can see the volatility in terms of the outcomes. The, the Italy and Netherlands I wanted to illustrate here, uh, because in wave one, there was one major change which happened in European policy. Any, anybody would like to make a guess in what changed in European higher education as a major policy reform? Bologna process. So Bologna process in 1999 uh, was, was uh, uh, initiated as a policy framework to harmonize the education system in Europe, uh, to provide more consistency and mobility of the students. And it enabled the launch of English taught programs. But the programs were still very new in wave one because they were still getting launched between 2001 to 2008. But in wave two, they started maturing in terms of quality, in terms of competitiveness, in terms of experience, marketing, all those aspects. And they have started showing some results. Uh, Italy had a different experience than Netherlands. Now you can see the contrast right there, that Netherlands actually got 200% increase in wave two, picking up a lot of uh, uh, growth in terms of international students uh, because of the English taught programs. And then, of course, the Asia Pacific and, and Middle East. Um, in this box, I wanted to highlight the, of course, um, being in Japan, you know much better than me in terms of the dynamics uh, uh, of what's happening with international students. But to clarify, this data only shows degree-seeking program, uh, degree-seeking students, unlike what Annette mentioned, uh, 
short term or non degree seeking semester long exchange programs or study abroad programs they are not counted here this only captures degree seeking students and uh, this is the destination country data so it is showing how degree seeking students have been coming to japan uh, so it will not look 300000 here because that definition change happened more recently uh, this is showing 2016 and uh, you can see that there was a massive growth of 100% almost in the wave one, but then a very slow growth of 13% in Japan. So actually it has kind of stabilized in terms of where is the next opportunity of growth for degree seeking students coming to Japan. But if you see in terms of China, a lot of share growth. So actually the demand for, the, for students, especially from on the four segments, if you remember, a lot of students who are looking at career advancement because they don't want to put the money down for going to US or UK, 10 times more expensive. They can't afford to go there. They are finding a lot more options in alternative destinations, emerging destinations. China, Japan was, was getting a lot of traction previously. China is getting now, but look at Malaysia, Saudi Arabia, and Turkey, and UAE. In Middle East, a lot of changes happened after 9-11, and that's why that framework of wave one and wave two comparison is important. After the 9-11 attack, uh, of course, there were a lot of challenges faced by Muslim students, uh, students coming from Muslim countries to go to the US, and likewise at some few other destinations. And in that phase, there was the rise of Malaysia as a destination. Not only in terms of the policy framework, but for, from the government, but also some, something uh, uh, in terms of the transnational education framework, cross-border education, or the branch campuses, which started picking up in Malaysia in this time frame. They were invited, they, they knew that they are not able to send the students overseas. So what would it take for them to bring the campuses to them? They created policy framework. Uh, Australian and British universities were the first to take the uh, bite into that policy, and they have seen a consistent growth, 151% uh, and 200%, and very competitive price, international degrees from Australia and UK now available in Malaysia. So now this 15 years, massive change. Uh, likewise, uh, Turkey, uh, while in a, a, a political turmoil at this point of time, but it has seen a dramatic increase in terms of attracting students from the region. Saudi Arabia, another economic hub. So the point is, they are not very far in terms of what Japan is at this point of time was getting in terms of degree seeking international students. Looking forward, if we add wave three, how competitive is the situation for Japan and larger Asia-Pacific region to attract international students? For that, we should also look into where the students will come from. And that's why the shifts in the source country is very important to understand. In terms of China, of course, the largest uh, uh, source country, uh, there has been a consistent increase but the growth has slowed down. Look at from 160% increase to 89%. So the growth tra trajectory of China has now already slowed down and it is likely to further plateau. And the reasons we will see by comparing the economic level, uh, uh, the, the prosperity and the local uh, higher education system quality. Germany and France as the, as the destinations, they, they have pretty much remained consistent, but, but not much growth. France has seen some growth. But another example I wanted to share is South Korea. So you can see the dramatic increase, 63% in wave one, and then decline in wave two. Now this is an example of, a, of, of what, very much like what happened in Japan. As the prosperity and the quality of higher education institutions have been increasing in the local market, and the demographics have been declining, the multiplying effect of these two variables had been less number of students going overseas for full-time degree-seeking program. Korea, 
is having exactly the same scenario. So you can imagine Korea has much higher ability to pay and afford to study abroad than the next set of countries. So the next box, India, Kazakhstan, Nigeria, Saudi, uh, exception of Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, Ukraine, Bangladesh, all of them have much lower capacity to afford education, and they are in that bottoms of the, of, of the four segments. They are either strugglers or strivers, most likely. They don't have the resources. These are the top senders by, by the sorted by 2016 numbers. Good question. Um, but I, I have uh, um, eliminated one or two examples if the data was unavailable. Mm -hmm. Because for no, not each country, there was full data available for all the years. This is again from UNESCO data. Somehow this, the, the footer is getting overlapped. But um, so, so the point about the, the, the emerging countries is that they, they, that is where the growth is coming from, but the growth is coming for low cost education. So you can see uh, Kazakhstan, consistent growth. India grew, but last, uh, relatively slower growth. Um, Saudi Arabia, the whole growth was through the funding program from the government, which has now been eliminated. So already the countries are, many institutions are facing a serious decline from the students from Saudi Arabia, because now the scholarship program from the government is eliminated. Um, Bangladesh, look at the jump. In the first wave, from 10,000 to 17,000, but in the second wave, from 17,000 to 61,000. They're not coming to US. They're not coming to UK. Where are they going? They're going to the destinations, to this segment. It can include Japan. It can include China. It can include Malaysia. It can include Turkey. But the next layer of emerging destinations, which are becoming more competitive in terms of their own higher education system and have the ability to attract students from the regions because they can offer affordable options. So after all these numbers, I'll quickly put some projections in terms of how important is the income level of the country for sustaining the mobility. Low income countries, so I've, I've looked into the four segments of uh, income levels, uh, which are defined by World Bank. Uh, so low income, um, lower middle income, upper middle income, and high income. Those are the four segments by World, World Bank income scales. If you look at the low income countries, and this includes, for example, Nigeria, the mobility is very very uh, limited in terms of growth potential. Over 15 years, pretty much flatlined. There is growth, but flatlined. And what you see in the dotted line is my projections uh, for, for the future years based on the linear forecasting with 95% confidence level. It's, it's not much likely to change because they can't afford. The ability to pay ultimately will define their ability to go somewhere. But then lower middle income, they have seen a dramatic change in wave two. In the first wave, they were very much mirroring, although much larger number of students were going abroad, but they were mirroring the slope very similar to the low income. And then there was this inflection point after, uh, uh, after the global financial recession, uh, but then there was a significant rise in lower middle income countries. And the projections for them are actually much better than the other segment. And again, it's a function of ability to afford. Lower middle income countries would be like India. Upper middle income country. Now, this is what drives international student mobility. 
So this is another part which I wanted to illustrate, that when we talk about international student mobility, we put it into larger bucket, but there are nuances by the income level of the countries, where the students come from and where they go. Upper middle income country. This has been driving all the mobility. Because they have enough population who can afford to study overseas, but at the same time, they have enough ambition to go out of their country. If they have the home system, which is so good in terms of quality that they don't need to go out, they will possibly not go out. Example in this upper middle income is China. The whole growth in the wave two momentum is China driven. And you can imagine if, it, if the trends continue, it can, it can really uh, show up huge momentum. And then finally, the high income countries. They are not sending as many students overseas for full-time degree-seeking programs. They are more likely to send students for short-term, semester-long internships. They are sending students overseas for global experiences, but they are not sending as many students for full-time degree-seeking programs. And you can see it has pretty much flatlined, very low growth in the two waves. Not much has changed. And since the uh, upper middle income countries took over in 2003-04, not much has changed. And this is likely, but if these trends continue, actually lower middle income countries will send more students overseas than high income. So you can imagine what, which are the high income countries. Of course, Japan, US, UK, and I also shared the example of South Korea. Now, this is the argument I was making that as the quality of higher education system in the home country improves, and if it interfere, interferes with the demographic decline, it's a perfect storm for diminishing the student mobility outward for degree-seeking program. That happened in South Korea, that happened in Japan, and the way the trends look for China, by 2025, the economic growth will potentially push China to be a high income country. And if the quality of higher education system of some institutions, not all, uh, some world class institutions emerge with all the initiatives which are taken up by the government, then there are a lot more quality options at home, which means China potentially over a time span of 10 years or so can very much start mirroring the trends what China, uh, which, which Japan and South Korea are already facing, which means a potential stagnation and decline in number of Chinese students going overseas, which means who will drive the mobility? Because China drove this mobility and there is no other next country to drive the mobility growth at the cost at which institutions are trying to recruit. Example, post uh, wave two, a um, lot of institutions had pressures, uh, especially English speaking countries, to recruit international students, budget deficits, budget, budget challenges. All of them are now facing some pushback. And these are some of the recent uh, news headlines. New school, increase to student fees and prompt outrage among student groups. This is in Canada. International students are not here to balance Dalhousie's budget. Poor English, few jobs. Are Australian news, universities using international students as cash cows? And even in Korea, international students complain of higher tuition rise than Koreans. There is already some pushback indicators happening from student side in terms of affordability, in terms of mismatch of expectations because if the tuition keeps going up, and if there are pathways which are very limited in terms of finding jobs and immigration potential, it could be a lose-lose proposition for most international students who are in that segment of strivers. You remember the low financial resources and high academic preparedness, career advancements is, is very critical for them. They are in a lose-lose situation. 
They can't find uh, uh, career opportunities, and the cost is very high. In the US, already there is a, there is a challenge uh, with all the pushback with, with, the, uh, with China. And that is also coming down to a lot of Indian students, because now H-1B visa and OPT, the work opportunity, optional practical training, uh, is very restrictive now for international students. Likewise, in UK and Australia, um, there are some changes which are emerging which that, that may make it more difficult for international students to find work opportunities. So to sum up this section, if you have on one side increasing, increasing tuition and living costs, and on the other side decreasing work and immigration opportunities, the multiplying effect of these two forces is pretty much a decline in international students, uh, but at the same time, students continuing to expect more value for money. So um, to sum up, in terms of wave one, these are some of the arguments I made. Um, UK and Australia lost some ground, while Oh, sorry, UK and Australia gained some ground uh, at the expense of US, as I mentioned with the 9-11 with the, with the attack. Bologna Declaration, 1999, that really created a momentum for English-taught programs in Europe. A new frontier opened up. I didn't touch about the excellence initiatives in Asia. Of course, Japan um, has run them, and I have a slide next one. But uh, Likewise, in other countries, um, even in Korea, and of course, China did its own uh, 211 and 985s over time. They started emerging during this wave. And these policy initiatives were all driven by national competitiveness, uh, reputation, and economic development. So they, they, they all had their origins in wave one, but mostly they were taking place in Asia from excellence side, but in Europe from Bologna side. Those two frontiers didn't exist prior to it. At this time, the students were very much looking for uh, ease of visa and pathways to immigration because um, many of them were at the graduate level. Again, remember that Striver segment. That was a traditional segment many students were coming at. In institutional driver at that point of time was research. And that's why also a lot of them were looking at recruitment at graduate level. The financial incentive was not so strong at this time. It was, of course, there was a segment of institutions also. There were some uh, uh, institutions driven by that. But m reputation, research, they were, they were the big ones. The student demand was automatically there. And that's what was driving uh, uh, the pull to the universities. But, students, uh, but universities were not reaching out as aggressively outwards, which UK and Australia did after 9-11. And, and they, they, they had attracted a lot of international students. So excellence initiatives I mentioned. So just, just to, this crowd knows it very well. But uh, again, the wave ones put the, put the foundation of that 21st century centers of excellence. So the thought process had already started. The policy frameworks were all, always there to enable how to make universities um, world class, uh, high quality, again, driven by excellence and quality, and of course, culminating to top global university project, which is currently going on. So there have been phases over the years in Asia Pacific in terms of improving the quality uh, as an indicator of national uh, competitiveness also. In wave two, US, as I mentioned, was gaining proactive uh, a growth because of the recruitment strategies. This is a time when a lot of debates in the US happened about the use of agents for recruitment. Um, but, and it was a contentious phase. Intensive English programs, boom, that uh, I mentioned. But in Europe and in Asia, the English taught programs started gaining traction. So this was, even though many of them were getting launched in wave one, it was in the wave two when they started seeing some results, some maturity in terms of the engagement and, and, and the enrollments. But as I mentioned, the student segment coming in wave two was dramatically different 
from wave one. And the difference was the rise of the explorers segment. The segment which has the money, but not the academic preparedness. And that segment, because they didn't have academic preparedness, needed academic support. Now this could be in the form of intensive English programs, uh, teaching English, on campus support. There were a lot of challenges uh, faced by universities in terms of uh, integrating international students and domestic students on campus. And a lot continue to face their challenges. But that support to the students in terms of on class and off uh, uh, outside classroom support really gained traction because the academic level of the student was different from what previously uh, was seen in the wave one. And as I mentioned, wave two had its underlying characteristic that the motivations for many institutions, many institutions changed to launch new programs, to, to, to be driven by ability to make sure that international student remains a viable uh, source of also revenue for universities. And that was a dramatic shift from wave one. And this is, I have to make sure that uh, I have something from Annette, uh, and she has done a lot of research on uh, uh, English medium instruction programs. But one of the things which uh, uh, in her recent article she mentioned is about the, that, that aspect of language is one, one important element uh, which needs to be uh, addressed in the English, English medium instruction program. But also the pedagogical and intercultural skills need to be addressed because the student success has to be aligned with the program success. And that is oftentimes missing in English taught programs also, that uh, just by having a program in English doesn't, doesn't fulfill the need or the goal of what the program should look like. And I'm sure uh, Annette can mention uh, more about it. So uh, the wave three, where, where potentially we may be heading, and the, and the opening uh, comment which I mentioned that is the number and the goal which we are setting for ourselves at the institutional level, at the national level, are they achievable? Are they sustainable? And to me, they are unsustainable. The bottom line to my analysis is that the, they are very lofty goals, um, devoid of some of the harsh realities of how the student decision-making process works. The segmentation of student uh, uh, behavior uh, in terms of who they are and where they want to go, what drives them, uh, and how the hierarchy of quality in terms of student expectation and perceptions work. All those complexities when you add up with the affordability crisis, the numbers are completely out of sync. I have seen strategic plans of universities uh, where they are saying in five years to double the number of international students from 500 to 1,000. just not possible if, if you are thinking to continue with the same uh, uh, approaches. The reason being the cycle at which, the, 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 how the cycle works of admissions, it takes time. It's a lot of it is driven by perceptions from the students, the role of word of mouth, the segments. All those things are, are really influential in terms of how students make the choices. And as I mentioned about the, the China effect and other uh, uh, political forces which are making it more difficult for the students to find work opportunities in future, um, it looks unsustainable to find that number of students. 2.8 million if everything continues as wave two. So US and UK are definitely going to lose uh, in this wave three. In this time frame, where the political forces are definitely trying to push back against uh, the international students in these destinations, they are likely to lose. But the winners could be actually some of the countries in Asia, some of the countries in Europe, who launched English taught programs in wave one, who matured their programs in wave two, are at a prime place to offer the value proposition for the students who can now gain access to high quality institutions in Europe and Asia at a much lower cost than English speaking destinations. 
we need to get our act together in terms of offering the value for money and communicating that value for money to the segment of the students we discussed. But there is potential for new English taught ma uh, master's programs and bachelor's programs to achieve the, those goals if, if we can offer that value for money. And that was my uh, point about student need uh, because the next segment of growth is all coming from countries who have affordability on their mind as the number one thing. And affordability and immigration uh, wor work potential. So the institutional imperative at this point of time is to come, come up with solutions which are beyond the natural course of constraints. Uh, uh, so that requires innovation. By definition, uh, innovation is, could be incremental. It is, it's not discovery. It's an incremental change. But an incremental change to a level where you start offering more value to your students, which is easier said than done, because change is difficult. Institutional change is even more difficult in higher education. So that's where the point is that it is, it is really a call to action for us to start thinking at policy level and at the institutional level to figure out how we can offer more value for money for international students. Here's one example from, from uh, US. I, I picked up this example to show that even one of the most respected institutions in technology, which has no incentive or need to dramatically change, had to change have changed, is changing. And it's not easy. What this slide shows is a Georgia Tech's program online of Master of Science in Computer Studies, uh, Computer Science, which was launched in 2013 at $6,600. Almost one-seventh the cost of their on-campus program. And the students who are engaged here, so of course, they got students from all around the world. But what, what is amazing is that they also got 600 students from India, 623 from China, and then, of course, there is a whole spectrum of students all around the world. You can imagine for a research-intensive university reputed one to make an institutional change and get a faculty buy-in to launch a program which potentially can be perceived as, uh, as cannibalizing the on-campus program could be very difficult. But it was done. Um, so there is hope and there is potential uh, for, the, for the change. The, the reason is not just to launch online programs as the only strategy. Uh, it is one of the strategies. Uh, there are other ways. But the important thing to note here is that expecting that the student will come to the campus is, will, will not be sufficient. We have to find ways to take the programs to the students also. Temple being here, we, we, we are already seeing this uh, from Philadelphia to, to uh, Tokyo. The program came to the students. Um, so Temple has a long history here. But that history also shows that it's an important way of making a global engagement work. Because if not all the students are able to come, then we need to find ways to take the institution to the students. And hence, the student mobility should complement program mobility. That's a, that's, a, that's a closing point I wanted to make. Um, and to, just to summarize, um, a good bit of time. Um, so this is the final slide. My, my core argument, if there is one message you can take away, uh, the numbers or the projections, what we saw in the last two waves, are not sustainable in wave three. And to, to get to that wave three, we need to make sure that we continue to innovate to deliver value for money. And for that to achieve, we have to make sure that we are considering this complexity of the mobility patterns in terms of source and destination countries. 
We make sure that we recognize the diversity of students. And finally, we have to make sure that our national policies and institutional strategies are aligned to make sure that there is a sustainability in the growth and they are not misaligned in terms of expectations because that will truly change the, uh, the results also. As uh, Annette was mentioning that uh, the goal of 300,000 has been achieved, but it, it did require some creative working to achieve that goal. Uh, and so, so uh, to make sure that we are re truly achieving the, the mobility, and, and of course my, my presentation focused on uh, full-time degree-seeking students, and there are also program innovation which is happening in non-degree space, in exchanges, and study abroad, which needs to complement uh, the degree-seeking student mobility. With that, I'll pause and uh, hand it off uh, back to Hanet uh, to take some uh, questions from you also and uh, engage in a conversation. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, Hugh Graham, I work with you, Annette, uh, at Meiji University. Um, yeah, my question is for Rahul, and um, I just want to start with a, a, a counterexample from Japan in Kaisei High School. Uh, for like 39 years in a row, it's been the top-ranked high school in Japan. And traditionally, in, so it provides high flyers. About 50% of the graduates go on to Todai or Kyodai, the two traditional top universities in Japan. Now, traditionally, uh, Japanese high school students have not gone on to do undergraduate studies overseas. But in the case of Kaisei, they've, they've really started to push this. So I think last year they had three high school students go directly to Yale, and uh, one student go to University of Toronto, and another student go to Princeton. And uh, they're, they're, they're working on ties. Like a lot of their students do summer programs to Choate and Exeter and, and a lot of the elite um, you, you know, U.S. Uh, prep schools. And these are Japanese high school students. And so um, so th this is just to lead into the question is, you, you expect the U.S. to be a, a big loser in, in the third wave, but um, is there going to be um, segmentation according to university, that some of the elite universities that have that sort of legacy, um, you know, of, of uh, having, well, I mean, the high flyers from Japan probably want to go and you know, meet and study with the high flyers in, in the U.S. And, and so, anyway, that was my question. Do you expect there to be, within the U.S. market, to be big losers and some, some people that might continue to win, and who will they be? Great question. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks, uh, Hugh, for the, for, for the excellent question there, actually. And so what you asked is, is clearly a corollary to the student segmentation. So like there is student segmentation in terms of need expectations, uh, there is a segmentation of institutions. Uh, there will be uh, some institutions which will be immune to a lot of the changes because of the brand cachet, because of their uh, location and the value proposition which they are offering in terms of the perception and expectation of, their, of the student to be there in those institutions. But then there is a large tail of mid-tier mid institutions, which will be literally in the middle of nowhere because they won't be able to offer the reputation of a top-tier institution, but they would also not be able to offer the affordability aspect because the, the tuition cost continues to ramp up very quickly. So if you add those two th things, the mid-tier institutions are actually most likely to struggle. At the bottom tier, I see there is a lot may survive. The reason being that either they are lower cost or they have defined their student segment to be the excess-driven student. They are not in the game of getting the ranking or, the, uh, uh, or trying to even try to get the high flyer. So their value proposition is clearer. It's the mid-tier who still is not sure are they really in the excess game or the reputation game. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Hi. Um, my name is Marisa Kellum, and I'm from the School of Political Science and Economics here at Waseda, Waseda University in Tokyo. And I'm wondering if you have any information about as tuition costs rise in the United States, as gun violence uh, rises at U.S. universities, 
do we, will we see U.S. students seeking to study abroad in these various destination countries? Great question, and I think uh, we, we have one example with Leo, isn't it, uh, who came from the U.S. to Waseda. So uh, you have an alum right here as a, as a sample uh, proof. Um, I would say that search for value for money is a dominant theme now. And that's happening with American students also. The, the domestic tuition for the students have been going up for several years, and it has outpaced any other increase in cost. So that's a known fact. Uh, so that search will happen. I think the mismatch there could be not on, only in terms of what one can afford, but then what one can do after that experience. Does it really provide the launch pad to a new country, uh, a new society, or does it provide a pathway to come back to US and, and find great opportunities? Universities which will be able to really clear, clarify those pathways will have more likelihood of success than the others. And so the push, I would say, is a combination of what's happening in the country, in the short term, of course, politically, and uh, uh, the aspects of what you mentioned. Um, but, but the cost crisis is real. Uh, and that will make a segment of students who look alternative. And Asia is, of course, one destination. As, but as I mentioned, in Europe, some of the, some of the universities are really ramping up their approaches of how they attract students and what they offer. Uh, and one can argue, culturally, it could be relatively easier. Um, and also, proximity uh, could also help if someone is in, in the continental Europe with seven, years, seven hours, eight hours flight um, to, to, be, to be in any part of the, of the Europe. So th there are those factors which will, which will create alternative destination and, and enhance the degree-seeking mobility of American students, which is on the rise in the last few years. Yeah. My name is Kazu Uematsu. I'm working in Showa Women University. Yeah, so uh, I'm directly in charge of creating association between uh, you know TUJ and the Showa Women University. And as you you know exactly you know, presented, I'm now trying to integrate TUJ students and our students. My question to uh, to Professor is uh, you know how do you perceive the you know competitive competitive edge of Japanese universities? In the future, and uh, I think you know, except for the very few you know uh, top end universities, which has uh, you know ability to you know, make uh, you know class class teaching in English, many universities you know cannot to present such a you know program. On, uh, they pro uh, they provide such a program only in Japanese. So under such a circumstances, how do you perceive? that you know, Japanese university is the competitive edge going forward. I, I really look forward to hearing from you because I'm running the university, so I'm very interested in your answer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, That's a great question, actually. And uh, I wish I can give a 100% confident answer, like this is how it is going to work. Uh, but I think you used a perfect word to frame the question, and that is the perception of it. And that matters because the gap between perception and reality is what will define the competitiveness. So for example, uh, perception um, could be uh, with all the top global university project and the policies and the outreach with many universities which are taking up, some of the rankings which have been published now with Times Higher Ed and so on, that there is that outreach which is happening for Japanese university among, the, uh, among the, the community of higher education. It may not have fully reached to the student level as actively as one would see it in the educator side. So there is more visibility possibly on the educator side. The perception is that Japanese universities and, and government are trying to become world class through all their excellence initiative. They're achieving some goals. But the gap is when a faculty or a scholar is here, 
are they truly at a place where they can say that they are getting a world-class experience or they are getting uh, 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 an experience where it could be very difficult to collaborate or communicate for the, for the, for the expected reasons of language and culture. So, so that gap between perception and reality at this point is pretty huge. So, so the perception looks like, yes, we are ready, Japan is ready, globally competitive with all the policy and the funding projects, it is there. And it has a potential. The reality gap is still making it difficult to deliver the results, which can, which can truly make it competitive uh, in terms of uh, total impact. So I, I don't know if I fully addressed your, your, your uh, question. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. I want to add on that. I'm sure all of you were thinking the same thing as I was when we were listening to the presentation, that right now seems to be the time for us to act in Japan because we've got the low cost quality education. We're already seeing greater numbers of students from Vietnam, uh, Bangladesh, Nepal coming to Japan. Uh, we've got to somehow now you know, narrow that gap between perception and reality and capitalize on it and get those students that are academically able but can't afford to go to the English-speaking countries. So everything's there for that competitive edge. We just need to work on it a little bit more. Yeah. Actually, actually that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, and I'm sure if somebody in the audience have uh, anything else to add on this question, it will be uh, useful to get your viewpoint. Uh, but I think, I think what Annette mentioned, uh, I would like to, to echo that. In terms of potential also, so perception reality gap is one, but potential aspect is also a third dimension to be considered, uh, and that is significant. Um, how to achieve that potential and maximize it in terms of institutional change, in, in terms of uh, uh, adoption of practices which could not be natural in the system, because this is about system reform. Uh, that, that reform and change could take time and energy and investment, which can go beyond just institutional policies and processes. It's about individual uh, uh, who will be involved. Yeah, thanks. Um, my name is Paul Kuo. I sit on the board of Temple University Japan. My question is, what are the trends in non-English speaking international students? So for instance, uh, in growing countries like Vietnam, Bangladesh, might come to Japan to be taught in Japanese or to China in Chinese as opposed to temple in English in Japan. So non-English international student mobility. That's a brilliant question, actually. Uh, I have not looked very closely on that trend, uh, but I would uh, speculate. Um, that uh, it is also happening in Europe, like you mentioned the example of Vietnam, but also in Europe, that's a similar trend where students who have the ability to move within uh, Europe more freely, um, they move from one country to another country, but at the same time already have the language or they pick up the language in the destination country. Uh, in non-English speaking pr uh, programs. Uh, I would say that it's, it's, a, it's a growing trend, but here the hypothesis is that the supply creates the demand. So the more supply is of the better quality, highly ranked institution in the perception of student to gain access to those university, even if it is potentially a non-English programs, student would be willing to put down that time and effort of additional one year or two years to learn the language to get access to that, that institution. Um, it's not exactly a parallel or an example, but I will support this assertion by, by what's happening with Indian students going to China. Uh, can you guess uh, which, which field of study large number of Indian students are going to China to study? Nope. Sorry? Medicine it is. Medicine it is. 
Now, now that's an example of uh, uh, India and China going for medical program. Nobody would have thought or considered that this could, this is a potential or a possibility. It's the supply creating the demand. Chinese university ten years ago started offering English taught programs for, in medicine, targeted especially for only the region, and India became the number one source country. So to, to your point, uh, it's, it's possible uh, with more uh, universities offering uh, intentional approach to bringing those students, but then delivering on that promise of value for money, that was it worthwhile for me to invest one or two years of learning language and going through this program in a non-English program, what would it mean for my immigration and career potential future? So that, that's where the delivery aspects come in picture. I would be open for, yeah. I'd just like to add, you know this, most of the growth in this country is in Japanese medium programs. As much as we talk about, oh, English medium programs are growing, the numbers are still very, very small. And we're still only seeing you know, a maximum of 20 students per year enrolled in a full four-year degree program taught in English. So the, the, the students that are coming from Vietnam, et cetera, to this country are still studying in Japanese. And we are seeing that growth. But to that last point there, if they see the possibility of being able to stay here and work here, that's what's going to drive the numbers, really, which we need the workers. We've just got to work on getting the, the, the visa and the immigration stuff sorted out for those students, yeah. Uh, uh, thank you for your insightful remarks. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. I'm William Swinton from Temple University here. And um, you, uh, both of you actually, uh, from the very start, uh, ruled out the non-degree programs. And so as we talk about um, innovation within institutions and sustainability, um, isn't that a big opportunity for institutions and for policymakers? And, and kind of the second part of my question is, uh, and, and additionally, what impact do the digital programs, the online programs that you mentioned from the university, uh, excuse me, from Georgia Tech, what impact will that have on the sustainability of um, international uh, uh, student programs? I would say the ruling out of the short-term programs is just because we've been talking about figures and figures are not collected. The, Governments don't count the numbers of short-term programs. You know, that usually when we're talking about students studying abroad, by default it ends up being degree-seeking students. That's a shame. We should be talking about the other programs. I personally believe they are more important. As Rahul said, that you know, rich countries are seeing growths, big growths in students doing short-term programs. That's how it's certainly heading for Japan. We've got a lot of students going abroad, but they're going on these short-term programs. They're just not counted in the government figures. Um, so to your first point of uh, non-degree programs, um, I absolutely agree. I mean, it, it's not to discount uh, the value or the impact of non-degree programs in the, in the international learning, but also global engagement for the institution. It's very critical. Uh, and actually, it's, the, it's a spearhead kind of thing. It's, it's like the first point of entry a lot of times in few segments of students or countries where you may not have a potential to engage fully with degree-seeking students. So non-degree could be a great way to engage and experiment. So, uh, and, and of course, it creates a new adult learners uh, 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 population, which are not in this typical undergraduate segment or master's uh, segment. So you can bring in people from later parts of their career back into the workforce, uh, into your uh, institutional strategy. So great value there. And it mentioned a point, uh, very difficult to collect data. There is no data on non-degree programs around the world which can compare the potential and the promise of these programs. It's anecdotal, it's institutional. But the second part is also scale, the proportion. So when we talk five million students, five million is a big number. Um, non-degree is still evolving and growing. The international population within that is much smaller at this point. 
So non-degree is very local in the sense, in the, it has the, the bigger impact on its local community because a lot of time, it, like we were discussing previously, they, they are catering to, for example, working professionals. They may be catering to uh, uh, English language teaching. It's, it's less so uh, international beyond English, English language teaching because how do you find working professional who is an international student uh, uh, also pursuing in the, in the non-degree program because the visa issues will come and interfere. Like in the US, you just cannot have international students as non-degree students. Visa required is F1, which requires full-time enrollment, which requires to be not in non-degree. So the only non-degree students are in intensive English programs pretty much. Uh, but the second point I think you mentioned about uh, online, and I'll let you clarify if my uh, comment makes sense. Uh, the, on, on the online programs, I would say it's a really important and critical complement because the, the, the argument I was making is that we are in a kind of an affordability crisis for many English-speaking destinations, not every country. So as we discussed, Japan, great value proposition in terms of cost, location, quality of life, access, everything, but can it deliver in terms of, let's say, the second part of the story, which is what happens in the classroom, what happens on the campus, what happens in the, uh, in the social and cultural integration, what happens in terms of immigration and career potential, yet to be answered. So, so online could be a very good complement in terms of addressing some of the affordability challenges for high-cost destinations, and second, it could be a great opportunity to elongate the engagement, continuous learning, which, which a lot of time institutions lose contact with their alumni, with their, with their uh, students after the programs are offered, uh, are done. So I would say online could be a great way to bring the student back and continue the engagement over a longer time frame. Did it, did it address uh, your questions, comments? Thank you. I can take that question first and then go. Uh, uh, I'm Hiroshi and so, uh, uh, okay, and independent foreign policy worker. And so I have a question about uh, national security and admission policy. So particularly about China, so country, so Ch this country is a bitter in rivalry and um, information technology. So is this, the is this one of the reasons why Chinese students studying abroad is decreasing? So the sec and also uh, I found that, uh, uh, so student origin, uh, in your student or or origin table, I found the name of Saudi Arabia. So, uh, so today, or today or yesterday, I read, I read a news, uh, news that uh, this country is acquiring a ballistic missiles from China. So how about so the consideration of nuclear proliferation and future acceptance of Saudi students to Western universities? So, so these are two, two points. Thank you. I will address that question. Um, is that okay if we take uh, all the questions and then make sure just yeah, we can address? Yeah, this one this morning and one more. Yeah. Because we have to be out by nine for yeah. sure. Yeah. I'll address that question. I'll address that question. We'll just take the two more questions and then try to frame them together. Yes, Hi, uh, I'm Howard Brown. I'm here from the University of Niigata Prefecture. And um, I want to go back to the, to the issue of the online programs. And you talked about them as a complement to uh, study abroad programs. And I'm wondering if you see the same kind of national level policy frameworks supporting um, online work that you do in attracting international students? And if so, what countries are sort of the leaders in developing these online programs and which countries are maybe falling behind? Or is this an institution by institution kind of development that's not really being supported by national frameworks? If you could just address that. Great question. Thank you, Howard. Thank you. This is Sebastian Massa from the University of Tokyo. I have two questions. Uh, one is, uh, you, you see in recent years um, the, the attempt of US universities or UK universities to embed their campuses in, uh, for say, Asian universities, where you have the Univers National University of Singapore that hosts a Yale campus on their, on their home campus, or the University of Nottingham linking up with their 
the University of Nanking. So what is your take? Have these developments somehow affected the, the long-term trends that you have described? Uh, and secondly, um, in terms of uh, innovation of universities, internationalization efforts, from a Japanese perspective, I would argue that Japan hasn't done enough. In fact, I, th I think we, we have seen an oversupply of, of reform projects over the last couple of years. I would actually say they have done too much and they have really waited for the, for the results to settle in. Whereas I think the, the structural sort of causes that have held back uh, Japanese student mobility are much more important in terms of labor market, uh, that Japanese students seem to be of the perception that studying abroad is sort of a waste of time when it comes to their planning of career moving on from university to companies. So the, the labor market and the way that this is structured and sort of being a disincentive of actually thinking about uh, going abroad and to study, how does that fit into your study? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Could you rephrase the Yale US, uh, Yale and US yeah. question? Yeah, I was wondering in terms of uh, those initiatives of US universities, Cornell and their campuses in the Middle East, Yale embedding their campus within National University of Singapore, sort of to catch and bring in those students from Asia. And so if you don't have to travel to the United States, you can actually get your degree at a, at a US university, settle within the United States, within Asia. Has that somehow affected those, those mobility uh, trends that you have described in your study. Great, Thank great. You. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> in the interest of time, I'll try to keep them uh, brief. Uh, on the first question of national security and its connection uh, to mobility, especially with China and Saudi Arabia, which was referred, um, that's the core characteristic of wave three. The new nationalistic political order where competitiveness of nations are being defined by looking inwards, by creating more barriers uh, for international students and immigrants, and creating policies which are, which are more sensitive to security issues. Uh, with China, it's, it's, a, it's a massive conversation which is happening with uh, US. Uh, 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 discourse is definitely shifting on a daily basis, but also with Canada. The Huawei uh, uh, fiasco which happened was all, is, is really deteriorating the relationship between these two countries. So likewise, that security has picked up the huge uh, uh, um, element in, in conversations, especially in, in uh, some of the leading destinations of international students. So that's why the potential is more for other destinations who have some high quality English taught programs or have an ambition to develop more or deliver more on those programs can really benefit if they have positive immigration policies, if they have, uh, they already have affordable programs and high quality programs, they can really start to gain from this push from some of the leading destinations of English speaking countries like US, UK uh, at this point of time. So, so yes, I agree that that security narrative is definitely picking up a lot more steam at this point. Um, to, the, to, the, to the question related to online, and I, please feel free to as, as you. Um, Online programs at the national policy level, I, I would say that th there are two forces happening there. On one side, there is uh, policy initiatives which are coming up from countries like Malaysia. Now that is going all the way in, in terms of integrating MOOCs, online learning, into their national policy. And hence, also trying to complement it with their national policies for international students. But having a policy does not translate into a reality of getting the student for that program. So that's where the, the, some of the policies have fallen short because the international student uptake for online programs for emerging destinations is still far. It, it is happening to some extent for the existing reputational institutions. Let's say that's why I'm giving the example of Georgia Tech, top engineering school in the world. Nobody has to tell that it is Georgia Tech computer science. It's given. So the medium of online can still be 
looked upon with the suspicion in some of the countries from where international students are coming from. So they would rather take the assurance of a top brand if they are going online. And hence, there is a research actually done that in online mechanisms, brand is even more important because it translates, it has to overcome the risk effect of the channel that will my degree at the end of it will be perceived as equivalent to an on-campus program. So, so that's where I would say that uh, some policy initiatives have happened, but they have not fully translated into attracting international students in online programs. Uh, but uh, it is happening a lot more at institutional level, one, but somewhere, but, but at a level which nobody expected is coming from MOOCs. The MOOCs provider like Coursera and edX are now offering online degrees. They are not MOOCs provider anymore. They have massive ability to publish, present, and market the programs online by of their institutional partners. So they're using their platform of 20 million students on their platform and marketing them now online degrees. So the point I'm making is that this massive uptake of online program by international students is happening, but it's happening through commercial providers who are coming from, from, from MOOCs providers and who are bringing them onto the one platform. And finally, uh, 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 to the question of Yale and US, uh, I would say the, the proportion of those programs at this point is still very small as you look into or compare with the overall schema of number of students who are moving around uh, or who want to study abroad. So Yale and US is, uh, and that, that caliber of institutions are very few. So NYU in Shanghai, Yale and US, few more. You can count them to 200, 300 partnerships in overall. In the, in the larger schema of mobility, they make no difference. F 10 years down the line, yes. If the growth traction continues, where these programs are being offered at a lower cost, but at the same quality, now that's a value proposition to difficult to beat, and it can start changing some, 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 some mobility uh, directions. I, I will pause there. Um, and then we can address maybe the, co the other question one on one in the interest of time. And it, anything to add? Okay, well, thank you very much. We are just about out of time as we are supposed to leave the room at 9 p.m. So please put your hands together and give a round of applause for Raoul. <laughs>